In this interview, I talked to Chris, a fellow YouTuber over at Niche Safari. And a little while back, he made a video about the KGR and why you shouldn't use it. Well, I checked out that video and he had some valid points. So I invited him so we could have a little bit of a debate. The spoiler alert is we actually agree on many of the points. And I thought his video that he created was actually pretty respectful for the KGR and pointed out some potential pitfalls that you should look out for. So we hear about Chris's background, why he got into YouTube, how he started with niche sites, and of course, we spend most of the conversation on the keyword golden ratio. So let's get to it. Hey, Chris, how's it going today? Great, Doug, how are you? Doing well, and I don't know you that well. We were just chatting and I realized I've seen you around a little bit over on YouTube and we have some mutual friends and stuff. So eventually I decided, hey, I'm gonna introduce myself to Chris and I wanna do uh, some collaboration because we have some uh, interesting topics to cover as far as the keyword golden ratio. But who are you and what do you do? And I'm interested myself because like I said, we don't even know each other at all. Yeah, so um, I essentially make websites and, and monetize them through Amazon affiliate program and through display advertising. Um, so I essentially got started in January 2019. So I'm about just over two years into this. I got started because I was originally, I was teaching at a university in the UK. Uh, my girlfriend who's Canadian wanted to come back to Canada. So we packed up and came to Canada and uh, I couldn't, I couldn't put myself through applying for jobs again. <laughs> I, I, I'm not really uh, interested in having a boss or anything. So this, this sort of lifestyle appealed to me for that. So just got really stuck into uh, all the podcasts. Started with Spencer Hawes, who I know you sort of started with as well. I followed his, I think it was Niche Site Project 3 or maybe it was 2. The one he did with Perrin where they sort of trained people on, on how to build out uh, affiliate sites. So I followed him, followed John Dykstra, came across you, you right when you started your podcast, The Doug Show. Um, and I was, uh, I listened to you know, most of the early episodes of that and then uh, just ended up creating websites. And the first one that I made, it was literally, I wanted to see whether you can rank on Google. Like, it seems like it's impossible when you've never ranked an article on Google before. It's like, you know, it's really impossible. So the first website I made, it was just, not even thinking about a monetization strategy, see if I can get, get it ranking on Google. Ended up doing quite well with that one. Uh, put display ads on it with Zoic. And then uh, based upon your recommendation, actually, you you were talking a lot about Amazon affiliate and it being the best sort of way to get started for newbies. So my second slide, I went, you know what, you know, Doug talks about this a lot, so I'll have a go at Amazon affiliate. And that Amazon affiliate pro, uh, website did quite well as well. It's still doing pretty well. Uh, so they were sort of my two base websites that um, were good enough that within about just over a year and a half, I just went full time on it, I quit my part time job. And uh, it's all been going on since then. So that's kind of my origin story. Awesome. And you said about six months, is that right? Uh, about a year, one year and six months was how one long it took me. To, okay. Yeah, it took me to sort of replace what I would have made as a university teacher. So I thought, you know, better do this than have a boss. Gotcha, that's great. And can you share like roughly how much you were earning after those 18 months? So after 18 months, uh, geez, I can't remember. It would have been maybe about $6,000 a month thereabouts when I quit my job. Okay. I, I don't remember exactly, but somewhere in that range, yeah. And did you have any prerequisite skills for websites or content or anything like that? Oh God, no. <laughs> um, I had no idea like what WordPress was when I started. I, I literally, I thought of it because when I left my old job, the lady I shared an office with mentioned something about making, she said, oh, it'd be cool to make a website or an online course or something and just make a living from that. And it kind of stuck with me for the weeks after I quit my job. And I was like, you know what? All I have to do is teach myself. I'm smart enough to teach myself just listen to podcasts, see what people in podcasts are saying. And I just like literally it's from like for the past two years at 5 PM every afternoon, I go for a walk hour and a half, listen to a podcast. So it's in just an hour and a half of essentially training or professional development every day. And that's how I learned. 
yeah, very similar to what to what I did too. And I didn't realize you listened to the show so much. I, I appreciate that. That's great. And I think, I mean, it's a great example. Like a year and a half is totally reasonable to pick up a new skill and then be able to turn it into a full-time income. I think most people, $6,000 goes a pretty decent way, e even in, you know, large, fairly expensive cities. And if you're in a cheaper location, I mean, 6K a month is pretty solid. You have to pay taxes and all that stuff, but uh, that's pretty, that's pretty good. Okay. So from uh, this point, you at some point started a YouTube channel, right? So how, how did that go? What made you want to do that? The like the whole reason behind starting a YouTube channel was to essentially get to know people. It's pretty lonely <laughs> sitting around building websites all day. You have no contacts. There's no one you can talk to who's interested in it. Um, so I was following people like uh, Sean Mars, uh, WP Eagle, uh, Amelia Gardner, and uh, they were all sort of sort of in this little community where they'd all talk to each other. And I thought, well, I want to get to know these people and become part of that community. So I started a YouTube channel literally just to sort of introduce myself to these people and say, hey, like I'm building websites too. And I'm always chatting in your in your live stream chats and things. But, you know, this is my story. Uh, so that's kind of the whole reason I started it. Um, and then, you know, I try to do a video every Monday now just sharing my thoughts on various topics. Uh, I have don't really have plans to monetize it uh, beyond YouTube AdSense ads at the start of it. Uh, it's not really my main sort of, I'm, I'm not intending for it to be an income generating source. It's just, I wanted to get to know people. And so I made a YouTube channel. Cool, that's a, a great way to look at it. And I think you're probably finding now and as time goes on, just opportunities will show up that you didn't plan for. So yeah, I mean, honestly, ads are a terrible way to monetize and I make hard, I mean, it doesn't even pay for my video editor, but it's kind of cool that you actually can run ads and all that stuff. So, okay, now you got the YouTube channel going and you listen to my show and then you thought, hey, I'm gonna trash the keyword golden ratio. So you did this video and uh, actually, it's a great title. I mean, you're a talented YouTuber. So what, what was the rough title, if you kind of remember something? I, oh God. Uh, so the title is uh, Why the KGR is the Worst Keyword Research Method, or something along those lines. Yeah. And something like, you'll die if you use it. Something. No, you, you didn't oh, really? say that. But, <laughs> no, you didn't say that. But uh, it, it's all in, it's all in good, good fun here. So I don't take stuff personally. And I, I watched your video because it popped up on my feed. So I took a look at it at some point and I, I thought, ah, you know what, that's all right. You know, you did a disclaimer at the beginning and you said, hey, no hard feelings. I have some opinions on the KGR. Yeah, so, you know, yeah. Go on. When I made that video, I really tried at the start to separate Doug's a great guy. Doug's taught me a whole lot. I really like Doug with this is research keyword research method and we're talking about a keyword research method not doug but i learned very early on in my youtube career that it's very hard to uh, separate things out like that so um yeah you know whatever <laughs> you, you did a pretty good job i didn't take it i mean honestly when you are on youtube and you're doing things publicly or a blog or whatever you're gonna have to get thick skin so i have fairly thick skin at this point so we're here and we're going to talk about it. We're going to debate it a little bit. And I think I'll, I'll turn it over to you if that's okay. And you could sort of point out uh, some of the flaws that you identified with the KGR and basically the reason why you did the video. So I'll just send it to you. Yeah, sure. So essentially uh, my critique, I guess, of the KGR would be, well, like there, there are several uh, but I guess essentially my main approach to conducting keyword research is just looking at the SERPs. So what's ranking in the top 10 articles and uh, seeing if there is weakness there in terms of uh, whether or not there are uh, forums like Quora or Reddit ranking, whether or not if you click into the articles, the articles are 200 words long and they were written in 2013. It's like, well, it's an old article. It's really short. I could probably outrank it. Whether or not the articles are actually trying to target that keyword or Google can't find a, a sufficient article to cover that keyword. So they've just put something in as a placeholder. 
So I guess my key approach would be to just look at the SERPs and not worry about um, sort of doing that, the KGR algorithm. Got yeah. it. And are you, do you like the, or do you use keyword search volumes or do you not pay attention? I know there's some people who don't even look at search volumes. So I do use keyword search volumes. Um, I, I did a little study on my YouTube channel a couple of weeks ago where I looked at uh, WMS everywhere, keywords everywhere, Ahrefs and uh, surfers, uh, surfer keyword plugin. And I compared all four of them for about 25 keywords and all four of them had results which are so wildly different. And a lot of them just didn't pass the pub test, like keywords that you know are searched for and yet they um, don't show any results. It says there's only 10 people searching for something like Justin Bieber's net worth. And we know that more than 10 people are probably searching for Justin Bieber's net worth per month. So I do use them as a general rule of like, if there's several of the keyword research tools generating 1000 plus saying that there's 1000 plus searches a month for this keyword, it's probably search for a lot. Um, or if there's only 10 search volume for it, well, there's probably a bit of people searching for it because it says that they've at least found a few people searching for this keyword. So it's more for me, just like a very rough guide on whether or not people are searching for the term, but it's, I'm not using it strictly in any way at all. Like, you know, if it's got 10 search volume and I think that logically people are going to be searching for this, I'll go for it. Okay. And I yeah. think that, that's a good approach. I mean, obviously those are estimates because no one can predict the future. And even with Google, I mean, they don't actually know how many people are going to search for a term in the future. So we can only use it as a guideline and in a relative sense, it gives us a pretty good idea. So one of the things you did point out, which the, uh, you know, and I'm going to get to the punchline here pretty quick, basically we agree on a lot of things and it's the way you pointed it out. I, I don't disagree with most of your points. So we'll, we'll come around to that. But you, in the video, you did mention um, like semantic nitpicking, which actually I'll let you define kind of what you mean in that. And I don't know if you uh, can come up with an example, but I'm sure we can kind of figure something out, right? I, I think uh, to my memory, I, I did one that was uh, best barbecue gloves or something versus best BBQ gloves. And uh, it came, came out that one of them had 250 search volume and one of them had zero search volume. But when you look at the SERPs, Google knows that BBQ gloves and barbecue gloves are the same thing and therefore it provides, generates the exact same results. I think, I think from memory that was sort of my, you know, it's hard to use the KGR when uh, you have to have a, it doesn't reflect search intent. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. That's a perfect example. And I'll give another classic one too. So top rated barbecue gloves and best barbecue gloves. So if you Google any of the terms that we just mentioned, you'll see that Google replaces uh, the less popular phrasing with the more popular phrasing and then it actually just bolds it or at least it used to bold that uh, specific keyword that they're narrowing it down to. So yeah, it, Google knows the searcher intent probably maybe better than the searcher. If you misspell something, that's another question people have. Oh, I found this great keyword that was misspelled. Should I go ahead and publish a misspelled keyword and a whole article based on that? The answer is no. Of course, you wouldn't. You wouldn't want to do that. It doesn't. It doesn't make any sense. So, the other thing you pointed out so you, was. Oh, go ahead. So just to just to go on with that, do you what what's your suggested solution? So, for example, top rated versus best, or BBQ versus barbecue. Uh, do you have a suggestion for? A solution when you come across those situations for the the best versus top rated basically go with best uh, top rated or anything that's not best um, just use best um, you, you can also check right like I said you can google the term and see what Google replaces it with and which one they use is sort of the primary as far as the other example where uh, maybe it's an abbreviation like the BBQ versus barbecue Again, you can Google it and check to see what is the favored search phrasing. 
and then go with that one. Oftentimes, like you said, it'll be very clear, like one's a higher search volume and the other one's zero or it doesn't register anything. And at that point, you would use the higher search volume, which may kick it out of the, you know, quote, KGR range of 250 searches or lower. So that's the best way to do it. But when it comes down to it, a lot of the things we're going to talk about and have already, it's the fact that you have to Google the term before you actually select that keyword. You have to, you have to look and see what Google is telling you. I mean, the information's right there. All you have to do is check. Yeah. Yeah. What about you? Do you have any tips on, on, uh, figuring out which keyword phrasing to use? I mean, it's not so, uh, to me from, you know, I guess if you say I have a method, I'm not sure if I have a method, but to me, I would have, you know, if BBQ or barbecue, it would have been the exact same thing to me. Uh, I, it wouldn't affect me which one I used in the title of my article that I was writing. Um, and because I'll be looking at the, the results that had been generated by Google, I would just look at either of them and, and see whether or not they have generated results that I think are weak. Got it. Okay. Yeah. And then f- further, right, you mentioned um, competition quality, and that was kind of a, a big component. So do you have anything to elaborate on, on that as far as using the KGR and competition uh, quality out there? Yeah, I guess essentially uh, one of the most important things to me is not how many results are generated, but the quality of the results that are generated. Uh, so if in the top five ranking on Google, we've got wire cutter and I would have set up until a few months ago, gear hungry. Um, but you know, big websites like that, if they're ranking number one for one, two, three, and four for that, uh, that keyword, chances are I'm not going to try to go for it. Even if it fits within the KGR, you know, if the top five articles are just completely unreachable, there's no chance that I'm going to try to going to rank for it. I would probably try to go longer tail, uh, find something that is has weak more weakness on the SERPs. Okay, very good, very good. And I want to jump into why it works sometimes. So the KGR, you you pointed out some some good issues, which I think were valid. Um, but it works sometimes. A lot of people will say, uh, you know, I've only used KGR and it's doing fantastic, blah, blah, blah. I know you can also find examples where it didn't work for people. Um, so I'll, I'll let you uh, deliver. This is a good point. So I'm going to let you uh, throw it out there. I'm not sure what point that, that, you, <laughs> that you want me to say. <laughs> oh, okay. So and the funny thing uh, for the uh, for the, the people out there, this video that Chris did was uh I don't know, it was probably like a year ago or something. So he, he doesn't even really remember, even though the wounds are so fresh for me. I'm, I'm just kidding. So it forces you, the KGR forces you to look at the long tail keywords because you're looking at 250 searches or less. And you have to be even more discriminating because you're using all in title. So it really filters out a lot of other keywords that may be more competitive just in general. Now, as we're pointing out, it's very easy to pick a shitty keyword, even if you're doing this, you can pick bad keywords that are long tails that are not gonna work out for you for some reason or another. And there's many reasons that they might not. Search your intent, competition level, maybe you've you've, uh, picked some sort of a weird phrasing that no one actually uses, so it's not gonna be super helpful. But I mean, the fact is it forces you to go to the long tail. So anything else to add, Chris? Yeah, I, I 100% agree with that. Um, I, I think I said in the video something along the lines of the the reason it does work sometimes potentially is just because you're writing for long tail keywords at a low low search volume. Because uh, you say, do you say you have to, it has to be under 250 searches per month? Yeah, something yeah. along those lines. So chances are you're more likely to come across long tail keywords if you're trying to find keywords that are less than 200 searches a month. Perfect. And yeah. I think from that you make my whole point on why the KGR works. So yeah, there's flaws in it. There's flaws in any of the tools you're using, any kind of method, but the KGR does give people confidence to look at some data, try some things out. 
if they go this one step further and maybe they watch all my videos on the topic or maybe they go to WP Eagle and they watch uh, some of his videos on it, they will look, they'll Google the terms, they'll look at the competition, they will refine and distill that list down to something that's even better than just long tail keywords, but where they actually have a chance. And then for some people it works out great. So it, it's this marketing thing. I, I gave a thing a name and then I kept talking about it. So uh, I, I think it, made it makes it accessible for people that are brand new, even with the flaws. Sure, that's, I mean, there are, there are plenty of different ways to skin a cat. And, you know, there's plenty of different ways to, to, to find keywords and rank them on Google. And if, if, if people feel good about using the KGR, like I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna tell them they're doing it like they're, they're an idiot. Like if it works for you, good for you. Like, <laughs> yep. And, and I, it's funny too, because people sometimes think I, I only go for KGR keywords and I'm really, uh, I don't know, like preachy and dogmatic about it, but I mean, yeah, use whatever tool you want. It's one of the methods you can use. There's a ton of others out there. A lot of them are really similar. And I, I do think, as you probably agree, long tail keywords are a great approach. However you find them, totally up to you. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I, I th honestly, I think we agree 90% of the time on most of the things. So I don't do that step of doing the KGR because, you know, I, I prefer a different way. Awesome. Yeah. Well, cool. Well, Chris, where can people find you? So uh, I guess, yeah, you can follow me at Niche Safari uh, YouTube channel. Um, just type in Niche Safari. Uh, you can find me there. And uh, yeah, I release videos maybe once a week. And awesome. I just release a video on whatever I want to talk about. So um, yeah, feel free to follow me there. Very cool. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, mate.